in the last video clip we saw how difficult it is to, uh, to control a tilt rotor. But this combination of a fixed wing airplane and a helicopter is very tempting. And there are other examples. For instance, the British Aerospace uh, Sea Harrier combines the features of a, of a helicopter and a, uh, and a jet. And you can see here, this is one of the exhausts of the, uh, of the jet engine. So it doesn't have an exhaust on the back of the plane, but there are four of these exhausts located at different positions around the aircraft, which lift the, uh, the aircraft. And there's a small vent at the tip to, uh, for control. This uh, Sea Harrier was very successful, uh, used for short takeoff and vertical landing, Stoffel as it is called, um, in, in uh, marine operations by the British. And it was also copied by the Americans and uh, built in, under license by McDonnell Douglas. And, and this type is called the AV-8. And it's basically the same principle as the Harrier. And of course, nowadays, you have relatively new aircraft, which also tries to combine the jet and the helicopter advantages. And that is the, the Joint Strike Fighter F-35 Lightning, which uses, in essence, the same principle as the Harrier, but has a slightly different mechanization. And here we see a uh, cutaway drawing of the, the Joint Strike Fighter. And instead of four exhaust pipes uh, around the fuselage, we see that the, the normal exhaust points to the back for normal flight, but can be rotated downwards for vertical mode. And together with an extra fan in, in front of the aircraft and two exhausts in the, in the wing, you can balance this aircraft. And the uh, controlling the Harrier was sometimes called balancing on a pole uh, because it was very unstable. And beyond a certain bank angle in hovering mode, you were uh, uh, unable to control the aircraft. With the Joint Strike Fighter, the autopilot is, is, uh, it has been improved, but still there are limits to, to the stability in this hovering mode, and it is, remains a risky uh, operation. I also said that with the principles to fly, so being lighter than air and pushing air down, that there's a third principle, but that normally is not used on airplanes. Well, there's an exception. Rockets are sometimes used for, for aircraft. We see here in the background the Hercules of the Blue Angels that demonstrates the JATO rockets. And JATO rockets stands for a, a Jet Assisted Takeoff. And this, uh, um, this, this JATO rockets are used to, to reduce the required runway length for large aircraft in wartime operations when there's only a short field available. And there are other ways in which you can use a rocket to fly. For instance, a, 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 a toy, a fantasy of, of, of uh, often seen in, in movies is the, the jetpack, attaching a jet engine to, the, to your back and then taking off. And these things do really exist. They have been demonstrated and there's currently a demonstration team. You, you can fly with the jetpack, uh, one that uh, uses uh, water or one that's really a jetpack, has a real jet. And we see here a few pictures. But the jetpack looks different from what you will normally see in, in, in uh, comics or in, in video games. And that is because there's an inherent stability problem with the, the, with the jetpack. And let's have a, a look at the equilibrium of moments of a jetpack. Imagine we have a jetpack and we have somebody attached to it. Well, this, this jetpack will be quite heavy, so the center of gravity of the total configuration will be probably somewhere here, which means that's where the gravity pulls. Now, often you see it depicted as if the uh, exhaust pipe the jet would be mounted like this, and there would be a force, a lifting force created by this, by this jet there. Well, if we want the forces to be in equilibrium and also the moment to have an equilibrium, this means we have to lean slightly backwards to make sure that our center of gravity is above the position where we have the lift force. So here we have the lift force and here we have the weight. However, if we, even if we have them fully aligned, there's a problem, a stability problem. Because imagine what would happen as soon as we have a slight deviation of the position, then the weight would be pulling there and the 
lift would be pulling there. And this means that we have a an, an moment which would worsen the situation. It would start rotating, so uh, every minor deviation would result in a, a loss of control, a lack of stability. And this means that if we want to have a working jetpack, that the exhaust pipe, as you will also could also see in the examples, is often mounted at the top. And there, for instance, like here, if we have the lift force created above the center of gravity, then we avoid these stability problems. Basically, the system looks then like this. Lift, if there's a deviation. And we can see that this will be automatically corrected. And there it's, it's inherently stable. And then we have to lean forward. Better for the fuel as well. So the, you will see that in jetpacks, you will always see that the exhaust pipe is mounted high, and that's for this reason. But even then, there's only a limited uh, amount of, of uh, pitch angle which you can correct, so it's still very dangerous. So don't try this at home, I would say. We are used to planes with pilots, but another type of vehicles is the unmanned aerial vehicles, or some say you shouldn't say unmanned, so uninhabited, or sometimes it's called remotely piloted uh, uh, air aviation systems, so RPAs. But I would like to use the, the normal term UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, which could do many tasks for which in the past we needed a controlled, a manned aircraft. It's still controlled, but a manned aircraft. One of the advantages of a UAV uh, was originally the idea to have many vehicles controlled by one pilot, one pilot on the ground, one remote controller. And in this way, with using more automation, you could fly much more efficiently by having this man on the ground controlling these multiple uh, uh, vehicles. In, in reality, you often see now for, for with military operations, you see four men manning a station to control one UAV. It's getting better nowadays, but originally you, had f you needed four men, so this goal wasn't really met. And now you, sh you could be really happy if you have one or two per UAV. And even then, uh, the crash rate of UAVs is still uh, higher. And of course, we want to improve the automation. It's, it's new that we tr uh, try to control it largely uh, automated, but it's still uh, it still has a higher crash rate than manned vehicles. So we're not there yet. And um, some people see these UAVs as, as, well, we already had remotely controlled toy aircraft, so it's basically a toy. And uh, you should not be mistaken in the size of these UAVs. Here we see, for instance, the, the Global Hawk. And that is, uh, well, you can see the vehicle and the man in front of it. The span of this vehicle is identical to that of the Boeing 737, a large passenger aircraft. So these are huge vehicles, and which also means that there may not be a risk for pilots in this uh, vehicle, but of course the third party risk of the people on the ground is still quite high, and you see a lot of limitations for uh, UAV operations in, uh, in, in civil airspace still. Some dream of using this unmanned aerial vehicle as fighter aircraft, the, the unmanned combat aerial vehicle. And this is a, uh, a prototype. It's not, it's not yet operational, but there are use advantages, of course. Uh, the fact that you can now pull higher G turns, so steeper turns, and uh, you, uh, make more use of the agility of the uh, aircraft, because you don't have the limitations, physiological limitations of a pilot anymore. And obviously, for military operations, there's less risks for the pilot and also strategically less risks of having hostages or prisoners of war. So there are huge advantages and this is uh, one of the vehicles that's being uh, seen as an alternative and some say that the manned jet fighter has already had its time and that we are now entering the age of the unmanned combat aerial vehicle. But also for civil operations it is considered to reduce the number of pilots in the cockpit. 
You originally, remember uh, how we explained, you originally had four persons in the cockpit, a navigator, flight engineer and two pilots. The navigator has been gone and the flight engineer is also gone in modern cockpits. Now we have two pilots and maybe we'll have one pilot in the, in the near future and perhaps even have zero pilots beyond that. There are still some issues. Uh, we want, of course, the crash rate not to be higher with unmanned uh, vehicles than with manned vehicles, so the reliability needs to improve. And, of course, it would be great if we then can also have the advantage of having multiple aircraft controlled by one pilot. Civil operations are s easier compared to military operations, less riskier and easier to automate as well. But there's also an extra problem with civil aviation. If you, f for cargo, I, I, it might be sooner applicable than for passengers, because the acceptance by, uh, by passengers uh, might be an obstacle. The acceptance on, from people on the ground, civil airspace already mentioned, but imagine um, what you would think if you are a passenger in an aircraft where there's no pilot. Many people have, have trouble with this idea. And uh, you wonder why, because you, often you already fly using the automation. But uh, probably the risk is that, uh, well, a situation like this, we see the cartoon here, where out of the speaker you hear, ladies and gentlemen, this aircraft is completely controlled by robots, so nothing can go wrong. Nothing can go wrong. Nothing can go wrong. And this repeats indefinitely. There is, this is of course just a joke, but there is a more serious aspect of this. And it is that the computer, in case of abnormal uh, situations, will uh, at some point accept that it's no longer able to save the flight. It might be very happy saying, okay, error 12, and it, we're unable to control it. So relying on the automation completely might be a risk, while human pilots have been known to save aircraft from situations which on paper seemed beyond uh, saving. For instance, the ran out, running out of fuel over the Atlantic Ocean, there was an Airbus which, if you look at the calculations, it could not make it to an airport on land. The pilots thought it was that close, they still wanted to try, and gliding to this, uh, this island, they made it. So the fact that a human pilot is also um, motivated to save his own life creates trust with the passengers, and we'll have to see whether passengers can do without this uh, mechanism. Other new ideas for passenger aircraft are to increase the speed of the aircraft enormously and create hypersonic aircraft. There have been many experimental uh, hypersonic aircraft for military purposes, but there are also ideas to, uh, to develop one for, for civil applications. Imagine that you could fly to Australia in, in like five, five hours. And the idea of leaving the atmosphere and in this way eliminating drag might have some advantages as well in terms of fuel and environment. One thing that's often overlooked, however, is that as soon as you return into the atmosphere with extremely high speeds, you create an, an, an area of very high temperatures in which the nitrogen will burn and in this way create a lot of nitrogen oxygen. So that is, a, that is one of the, the trouble that, well, you, you might not burn that much fuel when you are in, in orbital mode, but you create a lot of nitrogen oxygen, NOx, which is a, a huge pollutant. Still, it is a, a really challenging goal. And, uh, well, the, the Astrox, as it is mentioned here, is one of the vehicles who wants to uh, be able to carry passengers to the other side of the world in two hours. And, of course, if we are able to achieve it, that would really fill a huge demand.